You see, I'm sitting here because, does it work? Does it work? Yes. My feet are my troubles, and therefore I can't stand. I would prefer really to stand. I could stand a quarter of an hour, but not longer. And the lecture I'm going to deliver you now is uh, a lecture I thought a great deal about it, but uh, it is really uh, uh, a collection of impressions and facts, but the facts, I think, which are important and should be really uh, not forgotten and should be really kept in mind. Never forget, already starting, Confucius once said that if the meaning of words uh, are perverted, then, of course, freedom comes to an end. And the perversion of words is something which characterizes the American scene just as well as the European scene. Think about only one thing if you utter the word Holocaust. For heaven's sakes, it has nothing whatsoever to do with genocide. It was a pious offering of the ancient Greek to the gods for their favors. But it sounded Holocaust, you know, a grim, and therefore it was chosen by some jerk in Hollywood. And it is being repeated by university professors and by ace writers and journalists. And of course, obviously, if you think about the word the Middle East, a Palestine, Syria is in the Middle East. If that's the Middle East, please, where's the Near East? Uh, nobody knows. And of course, obviously, the word liberalism. I consider myself always did, not always did, but in the last, let us say, 60 years, as an arch liberal. I'm an arch liberal in the worldwide sense, which is not the American sense, because never forget one thing that North America is, in a way, a gigantic island in the world ocean and therefore separated from the rest of the world. And then certain ideas can blossom here and to find very, uh, very difficult to overbridge them, bring them to Europe and back again. I'm not only an arch liberal, I'm a rationalist. Never forget here that Bohesky, the great Dominican, has said that modern rationalism is nothing else but the grandchild of scholasticism. These are things which must be held in mind. And of course, being a rationalist and being an arch-liberal, um, plainly an anti-democrat, and I've just published a small book against democracy, and dedicated to the great Swiss and American thinkers. And they're all named now, let's see, they start with John Adams. Never forget that Charles Baird, has said the Founding Fathers uh, hated democracy more than original sin. A dirty word like democracy appears neither in the Declaration nor in the Constitution. Even the noun republic appears neither in the Declaration nor in the Constitution. And of course, obviously, the great watershed in American history, the same opinion I have as Henry Adams, is 1828. After 1828, the process of democratization has set in in the United States and unfortunately is not even now quite terminated. But you see here, this is a preamble. Now, of course, if you look back to history, Western history, there is one great break, that is the Reformation, the reformers, you have to bear in mind, were arch-conservatives. There were medieval arch-conservatives who were fighting modernism of the 16th century. They were fighting the spirit of Christian humanism and of the Renaissance. The real year of the Reformation is the winter 1510, 1511, Luther in Rome, and just sees now Christian humanism and antiquity their life before him, pagans, they're all for him, roasting in the everlasting fires of hell. As we were told, I had been studying Luther, but I have to correct that. Of the 107 volumes of about 600 pages each, 
I did read probably something nearly one third. <laughs> but everything very personal. I've read everything very personal. And of course the picture what Luther was and taught, the Catholic and the so-called Protestant, I hate to use the word, and the Protestant idea are equally false. It was something entirely different. The reform was Calvin too, entirely different. But then comes the French Revolution, you see, and as a young man, and you still find that in the original edition of My Liberty or Equality, there I had the idea which has been shared by many, many European Catholic conservatives that there is a real evolution from the Reformation leading to the French Revolution, which is absolutely wrong. What happened is that prior to the French Revolution, you have the first enlightenment, and it is the first enlightenment which completely perverted the ideas of the reformers. In other words, what came out, 19th century Protestantism, if you like the word, in 20th century Protestantism is the very opposite of what the reformers aimed at or believed in. But then you have the French Revolution, and of course from the French Revolution, then you have the real descendants of socialism, nationalism. Don't forget we use the word nationalism in Europe as ethnicism. And it, be, it belongs to folk, nationalism, socialism, national socialism, international socialism. And they are merely, they are not enemies, they are competitors. Something quite different. And competitors can, well, they can ally themselves and combine. And this is what they done, of course, the National International Socialists in 1939, a joint war against, uh, let us say, conservative and reactionary Poland. This is the start of World War II. But you see here, this, these sort of backgrounds are important to remember. And then comes the enormous victory of international socialism. And this great victory of international socialism, that means of communism, it's the Social Democratic Party. Never forget that. The Social Democratic Party, the radical part, they had this piece on their electing, on their electing uh, election pieces written Social Democrats, and in brackets, B, Bolsheviki, Majority Group, or M, Mensheviki, Minority Group. The Social Democrats really have, it's very amusing, established the Cheka in December 1917. Only the year after that, they finally dropped the Social Democratic and, of course, called, going back to Karl Marx, called themselves communists. And, of course, now comes the great communist menace. I mean, the Western Europe is menaced by socialism, communism, militarily, but not only militarily, politically, intellectually, from every angle. And then you have now the rallying cry for people who are really interested in freedom. That means in Europe of genuine liberals. Now when we use the word liberal, you have to bear in mind that there are four phases of liberalism. There is pre-liberalism, that means men who can be considered to be liberals, but do not use the expression at all, and are very often are called conservatives. I never use for myself the word conservative, and I'm going to give you maybe the reason why I never call myself a conservative. It is Nicolas Gomez Davila, the greatest rightist thinker. He died two years ago. He was a Colombian. He's so important that I'm quite sure that you never heard his name. <laughs> but by now, of course, he has been translated into German and from Spanish, of course. Six volumes only of aphorisms. But these six volumes of aphorisms give you a wonderful picture. Where's the American publisher who would publish? Nicolas Gomez Davila. And he said, nowadays you can't be conservative. What you find today, you don't want to conserve at all. <laughs> a man of the right, and I am a man of the right, right is right and left is wrong. 
don't forget that. A man of the right can't be a conservative. And actually, there is no Catholic country in Europe which has a conservative party. All the conservative parties really live, and that is, of course, has a deeper reason, as you now may conceive, uh, only in the countries where the Reformation has prevailed. That means in Scandinavia and in Holland and in England and in, and in uh, Canada and, in, uh, and, and so forth. So you see here now these pre liberals. These are men like Adam Smith, and you know American conservatives sport the Adam Smith tie. No, that is not nonsense, no, that makes good reason. The other one would be Burke. Burke is a pre liberal. A pre liberal, not using the term. But then where does the term arise? Naturally, I would say, obviously, in a country where individual freedom is fanatically defended in Spain. In Spain, 1812, in Cadiz, southern city, liberated from the Napoleonic yoke, in the first parliament they called themselves Los Liberales and called their adversaries, they called Los Serviles, the servile ones. And in, South, in England, in 1816, he uses the very first time the expression liberal, but in the Spanish form, our British liberales, L-E-S. You see? And then Sir Walter Scott writes about our English liberaux, A-U-X uses the French expression, liberalism is continental. Never forget here, you see, that the real mind and mentality of the old faith, this is of the Catholic faith, you see, is that libertarian ones. You see, personal freedom, when they introduced the traffic lights in Argentine, the Argentines immediately drew their pistols and shot them down and said, a free man in Argentina is not going to follow. And therefore, only in the country of the old religion, it means the Catholic countries and the Russian Orthodox, the Orthodox countries, they have then the phenomenon of anarchism, because anarchism is a liberalism running wild. And therefore the enthusiasm in Catholic countries for anarchists, even for anti-anarchists. Do you realize now, you remember, all the ones of you certainly, the Sacco and Vanzetti case, these were two anarchists. It was all of Catholic Europe, uh, the Pope of course, Mussolini, Salazar, everybody was for Sacco and Vanzetti praying that the Americans won't execute them. Actually, the ashes of Vanzetti, who was, if you really know the whole investigations, who was innocent, Sacco was guilty of murder, Vanzetti kept his mouth shut. He was innocent, his ashes were brought, his remains to Italy, to fascist Italy, and there, of course, a whole cult developed in fascist Italy, a man called Rusticucci, wrote a book, Tragedia e Supplizio di Sacco e Vanzetti, and the preface was written by Arnaldo Mussolini, the brother of Mussolini. If you don't understand that, you understand nothing about Europe. You see here, in other words, you always have to keep in mind this is another world with other feelings, other reactions. The Pope himself and I with a group of Hungarian monarchists who went to church and praying for Sacco and Vanzetti. And Mussolini said, of course, we despise socialists. You know, but anarchists, of course, at heart, we all are anarchists. We hate the state, who I consider now, speaking theologically, as the result of original sin. Without original sin, perfect man, there is no state. There is no state. This is a result of original sin. Of course, there's no university either. No, no, there's no medical faculty, of course. Obviously, I mean, legal faculty, all, all that doesn't exist. You always have always to keep in mind what would be human perfection in theory and what are the results of human imperfection. And monarchy is really trying here in a way, I mean, that is the tradition and the impact of monarchy in a way the idea was that we are ruled as a huge family. That was a personal experience. I still had a small child in, 
in the housings of simple people over the marital bed was hanging the, the picture of the emperor and the empress and there were there were sort of parents and you you really people really loved them the idea was a family you see familistic but not paragraphs and the law and the constitution you know uh, we are we are just a huge family and of course, obviously, the monarchy always keep that in mind, an international institution. The only genuine, genuine, really local national dynasties were Montenegro and Serbia, Karadjordjevic family and Petrovic, Njegos. The Romanovs had died out already with Peter II, and the Habsburgs are Swiss, they are Austrian, the Tory, the Hohenzollerns are Prussians. They are Alemannic and the Saxe Coburg Gotha ruled in England and they ruled in Belgium and they ruled in Portugal and they ruled in Bulgaria and they ruled in Saxe Coburg. And the Sonderburg Luxburg Augustenburg family, they ruled in Denmark and in Norway and in Greece. And to that family belongs the present husband of the uh, of the British Queen. So the House of Windsor is just to say a label. In, in other words, but you see here the impact of nationalism changing the name of a ruling family. 1915 in World War One, the House of Windsor, and William II, who was a man of considerable amount of humor, said, "Children, next time we go to the opera and we see the merry wife of Saxe Gotha." <laughs> now you see pre-liberals, pre-liberals first. Second thing, the second stage is the early liberals. The early liberals are all Catholic aristocrats. The Tocqueville, Montalembert, and Acton. Acton only dies in 1902. You see? You see here, this is overlapping. They are all, these periods are overlapping. And then after the early liberals, you get the old liberals. And the old liberals are very often agnostic and are relativistic. Truth, where is truth? It's the old question, don't forget that. Pilate asked Christ, T.S.D. Aletheia, what is truth? I also painted that scene. You see, what is truth? We don't know the truth is, truth is relative. Does it exist? And if it exists, is it humanly achievable? So we need freedom. That's uh, really, the old liberals is a sort of heresy. And then the break in the liberal camp with the exodus of the new liberals. Now, what has happened, we go back now to the end of World War II, the international menace, the Soviets menacing Europe, so many intellectuals, so many outstanding people are siding with socialism, and the creation of a society which tries intellectually to put a hold to that. And that was the more Pellerin Society, which congregated in 1947 in the more Pellerin Hotel near Vevey in Switzerland. And there's something very significant happens. Now the, the, the moving men were then, men I have known, fairly well known, or very well known even, I would say, that is uh, Friedrich August von Hayek, then uh, von Mises, then uh, my good friend Röttke, and finally Alexander Rüsto. Now you know the three first names by Alexander Rüsto, unfortunately most of you don't know his name at all. He's a very important man. Now the background of this man is interesting. Now Hayek comes from the old nobility, from the old Roman, uh, Holy Roman Empire. Some people say he must be a little Jewish family. <laughs> no, no, he comes from the Holy Roman Empire. Then of course uh, a noble Jew, that is, uh, that is Mises. And then finally Röpke, son of a pharmacist, but you must know pharmacists don't think about the drugstore. You could only become a magister of pharmacy provided you had a complete command of Latin and Greek. 
<laughs> you know, this is, this is a very different world. In other words, he comes from a highly cultured family. And then the very interesting man, Alexander Rusto. Rusto comes from a family which has produced, I can't tell you exactly, please don't quote me for that reason, four or five Prussian generals. And as a matter of fact, the father of our Alexander Rusto was uh, a Prussian general. But he, a great uncle, in 1852, who was also a high staff officer of Prussia, broke with Prussia, left Prussia, and became actually the chief of the general staff of the Italian revolutionary Garibaldi. And he ended up by becoming colonel of the highest rank of the Swiss Federal Army. In other words, went left completely. And so did Alexander Rusto, whom I knew very well. He also became uh, an extreme leftist, a Spartacist, a revolutionary socialist. Then, of course, without any penny, he was saved by a very interesting Catholic priest who was called Karl Sonnenschein. He appears also in one of my novels who took care of uh, decayed intellectuals, provided him with a room and a table and a bed and food and a typewriter and paper. And that is the origin now of Alexander Rusto, who then became, nevertheless, became professor. And when the Nazis came, emigrated immediately and went to Turkey, went to Constantinople. And so was Röpke. Röpke also, with the advent of the Nazis in 1934, went to Constantinople. They did not want to go to America. They said, that we want to be in Europe or near to Europe. Röpke was several years in Constantinople and then migrated and went to Geneva. So he didn't want to come here. And I remember the writings of Röpke. I lived during the war in the United States, keep that in mind. And a group of us, of course all right-wingers, obviously, we, were, we got from Switzerland articles of Röpke. What a delight. What a delight. Now, Röpke is coming slowly now into its own, and as you probably know, in the Franciscan University in uh, Steubenville, Ohio, there is a Röpke Institute, and I became a close friend of Röpke. Now, you see, these men here, Hayek, a typically old liberal, a quite typically old liberal, and, and uh, for Mises, a quite typically old liberal, and then later on, these two men, now Röpke and uh, Rusto. Rusto's great work, it's a fantastic work, three volumes, Ortsbestimmung der Gegenwart, which is very, very difficult to translate. It means an effort to establish the place or the moment in which we are now living. Three highly documented volumes. And unfortunately, they have been translated into English and condensed into one volume, for commercial reasons, of course. Too expensive, you see, to publish the whole individual work. And that man was, of course, uh, one of the very great thinkers. Now, economically, if we think now a little bit a moment, we go back, economically, they all have avowed, uh, Hayek told me in so many words, and Röpke also told me in so many words, that they really are, they really said, we are disciples of Mises. Mises belonged to a, a noble Jewish family, his father was extremely wealthy, and donated enormous sums for charity, which moved Francis Joseph, and he nobilitated his father. Of course, Hayek belonging to the Austrian school. Now, the Austrian school, and this is very typical, the Austrian school was founded by von Menger. Menger was a friend of the crown prince of Austria in the 19th century, the most unfortunate Archduke Crown Prince Rudolf. What what is this noise coming from? It's another meeting. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, coming from the um, no. Yes, Arch Archduke Rudolf, Bayerling, suicide, you know, frightful scandal. A very gifted man from Menger. His disciples were Böhm von Barwerk. You find this Böhm von Barwerk, for instance, on one Austrian bank bill, von Wieser, Hayek, von, von Hayek, von Haberler, and finally of Machlow. Machlow was the only man in the original Austrian school which, who did not belong to the nobility. Now you must always realize here the nobility always had this tendency towards freedom. Chesterton said, the poor people never minded if they were ruled, if they were well ruled. But they said aristocracies, they don't want to be ruled at all. And therefore, you see, the idea, when I lived here in America, when the idea was by Mr. Wallace, by your Henry Wallace, your vice president, that what we have to expect is the age of the common man. Well, the common man established National Socialism. The common man, and of course, the people who wanted to slaughter the beast were of the highest nobility on the 20th of July. I mean, the whole representation of National Socialism was absolutely, let us say, the contrary from the truth. It was very funny when then finally the, the, uh, the American troops occupied Germany, and of course the other allies, everybody had to fill out to get any job whatsoever, had to out the Fragebogen, an inquiry sheet, and on that inquiry sheet, uh, uh, he had to, there was one question, was one of your four grandparents had a title of nobility? If you had one, you were suspect. The idea was the Nazism, that was the movement of the heel-kicking Junkers with monocles and riding boots and whips, and that the common man, you see. Uh, the opposite was true. And it's a totally, totally false picture. You see, here lies, because don't forget how I commute between the two continents, the European picture of America is totally wrong, and the American picture of Europe is wrong. There are two wrong pictures on both sides. The idea, of course, in Europe is this is the country of the dollar. Nonsense. The, the Europeans are far more money-loving than Americans are. Money means to Europeans infinitely more than to Americans. What is important to Americans is social status. But to the European it's money. The, the typical French peasant who lives on the light at midnight and uh, takes out of his mattress gold pieces and toys them. That's totally un-American. <laughs> all these, all these... All these, shav all these pictures are usual. Now, let's go back to now the establishment of the Mont Pelerin Society. And there happens something which is really very significant. Because the, the, the three most important men propose to call this society the De Tocqueville Acton Society. And there an American member jumped up, pounds the table, Professor Frank Knight of the University of Chicago and said, if you call that society after two Roman Catholic aristocrats, he said, I'll quit. <laughs> and so finally they looked at each other and let's for a name and they said, okay, we're living here in the Mont Pelerin Hotel, let's call it the Mont Pelerin Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> you see, very typical, very typical. But you know now, you see, within, among these liberals, you see the great variety of views and backgrounds and inclinations and religions and so on. You see here the difficulty really to keep them under a hat because part of them really were, let us say, purely very materialistically monetary minded. And let us say, yes, economics are important. I said I'm an economist, but I'm not a homo economicus. 
I'm living economically, but I'm living intellectually. And also I'm living spiritually. You see, this sort of money madness and cash and banking alone and money and economics. And there, of course, tensions arose. And these tensions led then finally to a real explosion which did have um, superficially also uh, personal motives. In other words, there was the person of Dr. Hunold, who was the secretary, but the real reason was the different outlook. And you had decision between the old liberals and the new liberals. I was a member of the Mont Pelerin Society as a true liberal, but I left with Röpke and with Rüstow. And of course, I had to say goodbye to, uh, to Hayek and Mises, although nevertheless, I continue to entertain connections with them and uh, visited them until they died, practically. I mean, within two or three years of the death of Hayek. With Hayek, I always spent several days up in the mountains. An incredible fountain of information. An incredible fountain of information. Of course, these people are terrified about the masses terrified about the mobs. Never forget here because they did realize they had read Plato. If you read Plato books eight, and n eight to nine, what you discover there is absolutely, I would say, a Xerox facsimile of the transition of the Weimar Republic into the Nazi dictatorship. There you have the, the oncoming tyrant who establishes even a sort of guard for his meetings to keep order, law and order, and to throw out people who oppose them. So the transition is beautifully described, the transition. And they obviously they were afraid of the masses. How did they got to know Mises? I met him with Archduke Otto of Austria, the oldest son of our last emperor. In other words, it was an imperial connection. Of course, they all were never openly, as I do. I am openly an anti-democrat. But they never openly anti-democratic, but the fear of the masses. And they really believed in a horizontalism of society. Uh, a verticalism of society, not a horizontalism of society. So that break came and there was then the exodus of the neoliberals. It was a smallish group because a lot of people, even the first cousin of my wife, who, a cartoon, who then became the, uh, the president of the general secretary of the Montpellier Society, stayed inside, but my loyalty also with Röpke, we left. And this was very interesting, but you see the confusion existing, and I tell you, it is not part and parcel of this lecture, but it's quite an amusing little story, because obviously the Catholic Church was, and uh, they were anti the liberals, and liberals were the enemies of the Church, you know. There were anti-liberal parties, and liberal parties usually tried to be rather anti-Catholic. And of course, due to a terrific misunderstanding. And then in one Dominican monastery, they decided now these neoliberals, and probably I can imagine, everybody laughs when I say that, I see the monks before me sitting, and some of them say we're anti-liberals, and these neoliberals, I mean, it's the same old thing, of course, these neoliberals. And they are just like the old liberals. And we ought to write somebody a book against these new liberals because they created quite an attention and attraction, the neoliberals. And then one, uh, one Dominican father said, let me do it. They say, okay, father, now for the next two years you have no, nothing else to do. You write a great book against the neoliberals. And he took the uh, membership list of the Mont Pelerin Society, made no further inquiries, you know, and then wrote a book and everybody he cited in that book was an old liberal and nobody was a new liberal because the new liberals were people really 
in harmony with Christian thought and the Christian tradition. Imagine, a fat book, a fat book. And one nice day, in 1963, I was there, I was present. It was, it was really most amazing. There was a great Catholic uh, neoliberal discussion. Of course, Röpke was there, Rüstow was there, I was there, Götz Briefs was there, who had been professor also in the Catholic University of America. And then, of course, uh, priests, a great many Jesuits, and the discussion was opened by giving Father Navrot the right now to open up the attack of the Catholic and liberal. And St. Valentini said, and we raised the hand, not the neo I think you want to. But my book is getting into the second edition. I think all the worse for you. It was a wonderful two, two days discussion. Two days discussion. And of course, the poor man never opened his mouth again. I mean, he was finished. But imagine, it would be just like a Muslim writer writes a book against the Catholic Church and constantly quotes Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin. <laughs> but you see, see here, the mis <laughs> you see here the intellectual mistakes you can do. But you see here, you got this picture, you had the neoliberal movement, which in a way had died down because the old liberals were very much changed their mind. A man like Hayek, for instance, who was really, I had known him as an agnostic. But in his last book, he finally discovered, no, religion for freedom is important. It came very late. I mean, the Mises and Hayek all died in their 90s. They became very old men. You see, in other words, Hayek had really changed his mind. When he was really dying, he asked for a priest and finally got a wonderful Catholic funeral. And uh, Father Shashing, a Jesuit, gave the funeral oration. Father Shashing was in, at the same time a sociologist and an economist. So he finally re-entered the church. In other words, that thing is no longer here. The liberal parties are in Europe always parties of the moderate right. Right. The liberal party, the Partito Liberale, in Italy sits at the right of the Christian Democrats. They sit at the right of the parliament. The genuine liberals are people of the right. You know? uh, Archduke Otto, all the son of... Uh, our last emperor was member of the Mont Pelerin Society, and his brother Robert was too member of the Mont Pelerin Society. So in other words, uh, the right has made a peace with the liberals because they both have discovered the value of the old order on one side and the value of uh, Christianity on the other side and the value of freedom that we do have. Because never forget that the mode of life of the Catholic world is one of enormous freedom. I mean, the mode of life of Austria is compared to Prussia. But the mode of life, let us say, of Holland is compared to that of France. Uh, the uh, the uh, Spain is a land of unbound freedom. Always has been. Do you know when they abolished the Inquisition, which finally oh, became perfectly harmless, which was only uh, theologians were afraid of the Inquisition. It was changed in 1828, and instead of the Inquisition, they had a police force. Do you know there were mass demonstrations? Long live the Inquisition! Down with the police! Because the police could put their hands and their nose in all sorts of private affairs. Don't, don't, don't have that! <laughs> in, a, in a free country. I told you about the Argentine who finally destroyed the, the, tra the, the traffic lights. Now you know the temper of the, the temper, the real temper of the Russians is an enormous, this is, this is really an anarchic people in the last time I was in Russia. The first time I was in 1930, 31, in 63, and you see here the danger. In 63 I spent a, a month and a half 
all over Russia, went into central Siberia and the Caucasus, I was in Petersburg, at that time it was still called Leningrad, and in Moscow, and in all these all that time I have only discovered two and a half convinced male communists. And I came from Russia and spoke to a group of Russian experts. And I said, I think they can't be more than five percent. They laughed at me and said, five percent never. They're not, they're not two percent. But today, how many? Loads of them. You see here, the people. The dear people are, are interested in security, safety and security and food and bread, and intellectual freedom. <laughs> Only creative people are interested in, in freedom like that. You see here now in, in Europe the situation is the, the new rise of the socialist parties. All these socialist parties now in Europe are very castrated, you know. And in other words, Schröder says, we are party of the middle. He wouldn't even use the word left. And of course, I mean, they're social democrats. They're really descendant of, uh, of Karl Marx. But of course, don't dream of, uh, let us say, uh, uh, lead, go back to, to state enterprise. No, no, they are all for private. But of course they have already made the discovery that you can have really a form of socialism with private enterprise. Oh, that can be very well mixed with the social security and with an enormous taxation, of course. And you see the whole social security in the hands of the state. In other words, you, you see here these shifts in Europe. But you see here now, looking back at the past, what we have uh, seen in Europe, in that development, and the question of economic freedom, because obviously, I mean, the, uh, the idea, the socialist, the real socialist idea outside of Russia is fairly dead. On the other hand, you see how North Europeans, how for instance in Northern Germany, the effects of about nearly 40 years, the German, so-called German Democratic Republic versus the East, so-called East Germany, how many people are for the PDS? In other words, uh, on, on the other hand, the thing is obviously the whole, the whole collapse of socialism in the East was not through a heroic, gigantic, popular revolution. They went bankrupt, just like the corner drugstore. It just went bankrupt. As simple as, simple as all that. And they know that. And nevertheless, to a lot of people, this is really a paradise. And you see the a tremendous, what you feel, the immense immaturity, political immaturity of the masses. The immense political immaturity. And if we get in a really bad crisis in Europe, that's always possible. Then, of course, you will have the rise of popular leaders and popular parties. And then, uh, constitutionally, you can have the transition again to a form of really close tyranny. And you see the spiritual reserves of Europe are very, very poor. We have a terrific crisis of Christianity in Europe, which has hit the Protestants infinitely more than the Catholics, but the Catholic Church also have their crisis in the masses, the lack of spirituality. And now, the great question Europe we have is now the United States of Europe, I'm all for it, of course, the United States of Europe, but uh, what sort of spiritual motor does it really have, if not Christianity, if not Christianity? What is the distinguishing mark of Europe as compared to Africa and Asia? 
In other words, we are facing, I'm, I will be uh, again a great-grandfather in January. I already have one great-grandchild. In what sort of age are they going to live? What's going to live? In other words, in, in the worship of the stomach and of the, uh, of the, of the belly and of, of sex and the wallet, perhaps. This is a, this, this harbors enormous dangers, enormous dangers. I think I can terminate the lecture on this sort of uh, uh, tragic note, which we are really, really facing. And I do hope that you ply me with very concrete questions which, if I can answer them, uh, I will very gladly answer. Thank you so much.